Ladies Hello, and gentlemen, Sir. the legend. Hi. Hello, Yakov. Has Hi. entered the studio. Yakov Smirnov is here. Hello. Yakov, what's going on, man? How are you? Oh, I'm I'm doing fantastic. I um I just got a text from um uh, our mutual friend Lisa Correa. Oh yeah, she's oh. I'm, I'm friends with Lisa. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. I work, okay. She's a comedian I worked with. Uh, I know her, I know her for uh, yeah, quite a while. She said your show is amazing. So I'm... whoa. Oh well, my it, God! It well, we're off to a rocky start. <laughs> the micro Yakov's microphone just fell. That doesn't happen at the Yakov Theater, does it? No, no, no. no that's embarrassing. No, no. I also I, I toured with uh, with Dice for a few oh. years. He loves you. He talked yeah, about you I, all the time. I think he's amazing. He makes me laugh more than anyone. I, and I learned English from him, you know. Yeah, all the nursery rhymes. I, I. That's probably a problem. <laughs> 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 it's probably not the guy to learn English from. <laughs> How did you meet Dice? I met him at Rodney Dangerfield Club here in New York, and it was our first um, gig that we got actually paid. Him and I got paid $40 each. And uh, I was a little intimidated by him because he's a big guy, leather jacket, kind of a stereotypical a hoodlum kind of yeah. a... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not something I am attracted to but and he in the in the darkness of the club he was like hey yak you and i we're a good team you know and i'm like oh boy this is so i moved what are you gonna say no yeah like, yeah, yeah, yeah we so are I, yeah you, so you, i moved you to california i thought <laughs> that i'll 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 not gonna see him ever again and then he knocks on the door uh, mitzi short the owner of the comedy store had a, a place where comedians could rent a right. room and so he was the next batch of comedians, and I was already there, and he knocks on the door, and I'm going, oh, no. <laughs> and he said, yeah, yeah, I told you we're a good team. We're going to be together. And so we were roommates for three years. Wow. Yeah, you were yeah. roommates with Dice long before anything oh, yeah. Oh, happened. Oh, yeah, that was yeah, good. yeah, yeah. He, at that time, he was just doing impressions of John Travolta and uh, Sylvester Stallone and um, Elvis, he used to close his act with Elvis songs, and and uh, and then uh, HBO Young Comedian Special gave him a chance to uh, be seen by national audience, and took off from comedy club to. Madison Square Garden. And what about Kinnison back in those days? I know he was. Uh, w w did he live there first, or did he live there after you guys? No, he he uh, he never actually lived. He would just show up and crash there after nights of doing. I mean, it, it was a funny house because uh, a lot of people would come there. Robin Williams would come there, um, Sam Kinnison, and they would uh, they would get together like at you know, one o'clock in the morning and I was working, Mitzi hired me as a carpenter. I didn't speak English. So I was like working there as a carpenter and go to bed early. And then I wake up and they would just go to bed and I go downstairs and there's a mirror on the, on the table. And I couldn't understand why there was like powder on it. And, and I thought they were eating donuts, right? <laughs> on the mirror. Don't eat donuts on that mirror. Right. Yeah. So I would I would wipe it off, <laughs> hang it back, and I would tell them next morning, I said, what are you guys doing? Why can't you use plates? You know, you have dishwashers here in, in America. And they would laugh, and nobody would tell me what was going on. So that was my introduction to to Hollywood. Was them, them them leaving coke mirrors? I love that if you I couldn't even pass any drug sniffing dogs, they would have smelled it all over your hands from wiping it off. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you learned English from just being here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't speak English when I got here, yeah. How do you learn English and then transfer it into humor? Like how do you like all of a sudden while you're already here, you learn like, okay, this is how you speak and this is where the joke is? Well, I was come I was a comedian in Russia, oh, which was okay. hard for Americans in those days to imagine even that there is such thing as a Russian community. It sounds like Mormon wino, right. you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so that was a curiosity factor right away when I, when I got here. So, but I, I was hoping to be able to do comedy, but I didn't know if I can or not. So I got a job, well, I collected, my parents and I came together, no money. We're living in Washington Heights in a tiny apartment. Um, and uh, I, um, I realized that I need to learn English, so I figured, where can I learn and make a living at the same time? Decided to be, become a bartender. 
and uh, I got um, it was two hundred dollar degree that you can get uh, to become a mixologist, and so I have that degree, two hundred bucks, and it was on Forty Second Street, like on the east side. There was a school of mixology, so I would go there. Don't speak English. I would bring a that clunky big tape recorder from Russia, and I would record every. Um, lesson, and then I would slowly translate what they were talking about, Bloody Mary or Grass Supper or, you know, or Dry Martini or whatever. And that became my learning tool to learn the language. Well, it's, it's wow. crazy now. Like now on the phone, you have these like translate or Google yeah. translate. Yes. You can hit a button. No, yeah. And back no. then you had to bring a big shitty recorder mm -hmm. and go over it word by word. Yeah. And look it up. Yes. Hey, it, when you would back then, when you were doing stand up in Russia, like there's all these like you weren't allowed to say certain things, right? You couldn't criticize the government <laughs> or you. You couldn't talk about government, sex, religion. And politics. The rest was fine. Right. Yeah. <laughs> what did you stick to? Uh, uh, fish, uh, <laughs> buttons. I mean, it was literally, there was a mother-in-law joke, joke, something right. that would not get any red flags. And you would get approved by the Department of Jokes once a year. They would, you would submit your material and they stamp it. Really? Yes. Every state had a Department of Jokes. And then it would go to Moscow, which was the big department of jokes, or the uh, Ministry of Culture had literally department of music, dance, jokes, all of that. And was there any that were flagged you could think of? Like, uh, they were like what the fuck did they flag that for? Yeah. Uh, yeah, but you, you, we had to be careful uh, to begin with when we were submitting it. But I remember uh, a joke that I submitted. It was about... Um, uh, little ant got married to female elephant, and after the first wedding night, elephant died. And the little ant said, "Only one night I enjoyed myself, and now for the rest of my life I have to dig this grave." It's pretty funny, <laughs> funny, right? Yeah. But they thought I was talking about the Communist Party. Yeah. Oh, so, because the... <laughs> yeah, because it was it was it, uh, they were so concerned that people will rebel that right. even that kind of subtle you thing... change the joke to hippopotamus ah could have, <laughs> could have saved could have saved, could the, have joke. saved the joke yeah. oh could have saved that's it. true yeah. oh. well i'll go back and redo that now. so was your mind blown when you come to the states and you see that there's i mean literally no restrictions on what anybody I especially was... if you're hanging out with dice and kinnison yeah uh, well even prior to that i remember being in new york i lived here for like six months and I went to Playbook Club, and there was a comedian there. And he said that Jimmy Carter just had a hemorrhoid operation, and he's going to be a perfect asshole again, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. I literally, I was all the way in the back of the room. I ducked. I didn't realize. I was like, holy, somebody's going to shoot. This is going to be a major gonna, problem. Somebody, so I, I don't want to be associated with this when things when things hit the fan. And so that was my the conditioning I, right. uh, over the years, you know, but I, I, you know, I'm not complaining because it was kind of a, a great training for comedy for at that time, clean comedy was the only comedy that would get on television. So for me, I was already knew how to walk between the lines, you know, and not cross them. And, it worked for me. How did you deal with fame? I mean, coming from where you came from and then coming to the country and learning, you know, English through being a bartender, all of a sudden at one point in your comedy career, you just blow up. Yeah. You become this, this enormous High pop the culture War. figure. Yeah. In the 80s. Yeah. You know, you got all this money, you got all the, you, you freedom to do whatever you want. Yeah. And it, you've never had that before. No, no. And uh, it, it, it was happening gradually. It feels like it happened overnight, but it didn't really. Yeah. Uh, it took me like six years to get in the Tonight Show, for mm -hmm. example. You know, so I was earning every step of the way, I was earning my keep here. And uh, um, so, uh, and then at some point, uh, it was mid 80s when um, I, you know, I got sworn in as an American citizen here in New York at the Statue of Liberty. And that was a, a big shift there too, because I was there 
uh, and Barushnikov was supposed to be sworn in the same day at this big event. And um, all the media was there to cover, talk to Barishnikov, and everybody kind of ignored me. I, I, they didn't see me. And, um, and then Barishnikov, FBI guys came out and said, he's going to be performing later tonight. He's not going to give any interviews. And all of these reporters um, from Time Magazine, Newsweek, uh, um, New York Times, LA Times, everybody was there. They they were standing waiting for Barishnikov, and I was like hanging out waiting for this thing to happen. They're like piranhas turn and went for me, and I'm alone there, no PR person, nobody. And they're like, "Okay, I'm with Time Magazine. I need I'm I with Newsweek. They I'm had to with get the, something. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. And so all of a sudden, I'm like, I'm going. Who are you with People Magazine? Could you wait here? I'll I'll talk to Time, and then I'll talk to Newsweek, then I'll come back to you. So all of a sudden, it just became like, I don't think it will ever happen. It was just happened to be uh, the buildup of that Americana um, Statue of Liberty unveiling. All of that was building up to this event, and I just happened to be in the middle of it. And, and I, you're Russian, and that was kind of attractive yeah, too, because you know right. Russia was the arch enemy of the right. U.S. Exactly. Well, exactly. how how is it for business now? Because they're trying to uh, nah. they're trying to get Russia <laughs> back to being the arch enemy <laughs> yeah. of the I U.S. You performed for Trump, I, right? Uh, we'll say it again. Have you performed for Trump? I I have performed for Trump. Do you, say, do you worry uh, that they'll bring no, that up with the collusion? Uh, well, actually, I wasn't planning on on performing for Trump. I was uh, invited. It was actually Lisa, Lisa Correa. Yeah. Yeah, uh, she was at, uh, we were in Florida and we were writing uh, stuff and, and she got an invitation to go to Mar-a-Lago uh, to do this comedy show like a couple of months before. And so I, you know, and she said, uh, she texted me like a couple of days before then and she goes, you know what, I have this gig and I think Trump is going to be there. And I went, uh, uh, okay. And, and, uh, and when was this? Huh? When was that this? was last two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. And so uh, I said, well, I, I would like to, you know, jump in to perform just because it's an unusual spot. And sure. so, so, uh, and they said, sure, great. So I was able to perform and uh, I met Trump. I worked at Trump Plaza Hotel for years. I never met him there. And I'm, I, uh, and in Branson, he brought in Miss America, uh, pageant, uh, no, Miss USA pageant. That was here, and 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 so I met him there, and uh, you know, in Branson, I'm a big shot, you know, with yeah. big billboards and all of that. And so he said, "Well, this is your town," and I said, "Well, you have yours, I got mine." Yeah. <laughs> so so that was the only interaction, you know, uh, that that we had. But it was an interesting opportunity to perform, but. But the, what was happening in the 80s, the country was united against Russia. Mm -hmm. And Gorbachev was kind of making the bridge, but there was unity. Here, we're not. We're not united. So uh, Russian humor doesn't really... Um, it works a little bit, but it doesn't carry me for the two-hour show, you right. know? Um, and so it's an interesting thing. I'm performing at Stockton uh, University... Uh, this Friday and uh, at the Performing Arts Center and then in Schimmel um, the Center here in New York City at the um, uh, Pace University. So yeah. so I'm, I'm doing like an hour and a half show and my show is focused kind of uh, down the memory lane a little bit, but my future, what I see, I'm, I'm just about to graduate with my doctorate degree from Pepperdine University in California. Um, I got my master's degree in psychology from University of Pennsylvania. So I'm kind of became a professor at Missouri State University teaching course on happiness and laughter. So I'm kind of, I, I used to help to end the Cold War in the war room. Now I'm trying to end the Cold War in the bedroom, you know? <laughs> and I, I, and, I, and so much more job security there, I'll tell yeah. you. Because when the Soviet Union collapsed, yeah. there was a major shift for me, David Letterman had a top 10 list of things will now change. 
and I made number one on the list. Yakov Smirna will be out of work. Uh, it was bad for business when the. It was not good for me. At first, I thought it was kind of funny. Yeah. But then six months later, none of my none of my shows that uh, were I I had contracts Vegas, Atlantic City, Reno, Tahoe. None of them were renewed. So I started looking for a place where they did not know that the Soviet Union collapsed. <laughs> Branson. <laughs> and that's how Branson, Missouri I ended up in Branson, Missouri. I swear to God, uh -huh. I, I didn't want to go. Uh -huh. But there was no, nobody would hire me. Honestly. Wow. Yeah. And, Which and has got to be a I mean, just a total shock to the system because you were one of the hottest comedians in the he world. performed for Reagan. I, oh, the, and now yeah, all of a sudden, it's yeah, over. Yeah. It was over in the, in like six months. And I and like were, you just said, it was years, 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 build, build, exactly, build. Exactly. And now we're done. Done. And and uh, there was nobody to talk to. What am I going to say? Hey, put the wall back. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what am I going to... You know, there's no, there's nothing I could do, right? Yeah. So I, my agent calls me um, and he said, I can't get you any work, but uh, Willie Nelson has this Farm Aid concert and he would like you to co-host. It's a, it's a, it, there's no money in it, but you know, if you want to do it. So I said, well, Ames, Iowa is a place I always want to perform <laughs> and sure, I'll go. And I went there, and I was, like, real nervous. I mean, 40,000 people, all farmers, and I'm like, what do I know about farming, you know? And and Willie Nelson introduced me, and this 40,000 people gave me a standing ovation. And I was like, holy cow. And I said, listen, I don't know about farming. I went, I was on, you know, on a farm once, and the guy played practical joke on me. He, he, he let me milk his bull. <laughs> and I, I learned something. You milk the animal once, you have a friend for life. And, and the, the crowd went crazy uh -huh. for me. And so Willie, after you know the concert, I went to his trailer and he was like between puffs of uh, smoke and you can't even see him behind the smoke. And, I'm, and he's like, kid, you should go to Branson, Missouri. They'll totally get you. And I, I was like, what's Branson, Missouri? You know, and then I checked it out. Well, when Willie and, Nelson tells you to do yeah. something, you do it. You do it. And when you performed for Reagan, how did that happen? Like he had seen you on the Tonight Show and just liked no, you? No, 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 no. It was I was playing in a small club uh, in uh, Washington D.C. It was called the Comedy Cafe. I don't know if it's still there or not. And the um, the guy who chief editor of Washington Times, Arno Borzgrav, um uh, he's passed on now, but um, he saw me and he was there and he, you know, came over and he is like, you know, guy I didn't expect to say to me, hey, you're funny. I'm having President Reagan and Nancy Reagan at my apartment for dinner. Would you like to join us? Right. Wow. Wow. And, and the only, he was with a very attractive wife and I'm going, well, maybe he, I don't know who the guy is, but. You know, okay. Uh, uh, so I gave him my phone number. He calls me next day, got tickets for me to, you know, and we get, uh, I get to Washington and me, he meets me at the airport and we're going to his apartment. And uh, I don't know if you guys know when the, the, the president shows up, the, there's like block off the whole neighborhood. Yeah. The helicopters are on on the, above the the buildings it was scary crazy kind of a you know and so he we pull in pull in and, and they they ask for the id from the uh, owner of this apartment and he goes i'm hosting the president they said well we don't care we need to check your id and then they ask him to step out they search him i'm going oh what chance do i have i just right. i just got out of russia right and and the guy shines a light on me, the FBI guy shines a light on me, and then he goes, Miller Light Commercial, right? I go, yes. He goes, go in. <laughs> I had a better idea than the owner of the apartment. So, so the president comes in, and this is like unreal. This is like totally like in the movie scene, and I'm standing there, there's only 18 people at this apartment, and they're all like Secretary of State, uh, you know, big, big secretary of defense. I mean, it's like, and, and the president walks in and they introduced me and they said, this is Yakov Smirnov. He's a Russian comedian. 
And, and the president immediately says, have you heard this joke? And he tells me right away a joke about the Russian guy who wants to buy a car. And in those days, it took forever to buy a car in the Soviet Union. So he goes to a factory. The manager said, put your name on the list. Come back in 20 years. Pick up the car. The guy said, do I come back in the morning or in the afternoon? <laughs> and the manager said, what's the difference? 20 years from now, the guy said, the plumber is scheduled to come that morning. <laughs> I cracked up and we connected immediately. And for the whole wow. evening, the whole evening. Now, this was a, this was a pretty interesting evening because uh, Reagan sent helicopters, military helicopters to scare Gaddafi. So for the whole night, as dinner was going on, first of all, they had, like in the spare bedroom, they had the whole hospital set up just in case, you know. They, uh, the they do it in a bedroom, huh, right there? Yeah. Wow. They covered the windows with uh, plywood so nobody can see in. Uh, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty big operation when the it's president intense. goes out. And, and so, and behind him, for the whole evening, stands this Marine, uh, in a very traditional kind of a, with the uh, football, which uh, contains all the nuclear codes yeah. uh, for launching an attack right there from the dinner table. Wow. In and a football? In the football, in, yeah. in the, like a briefcase. Yeah, I see. And, and they call it football, but he's standing there holding it. And his job is not to break a smile really for the whole time. And him, and he's standing like we're right behind the president, uh -huh. and I'm looking at him straight on, and and I'm and we're all everybody's cracking up, and he's standing there <laughs> trying to laugh. Yeah, <laughs> can't I can't laugh? I can't laugh. So there was a pretty interesting night. So the whole night we were just telling jokes to one another. That's amazing. And what after pressure. that he laughed, and I was like going, "What just happened? Yeah, yeah. What did just happen?" And then after that, a couple of months later, I get a phone call from uh, President Reagan's head speechwriter, who is now a congressman in uh, Dana Rohrbacher. He's a congressman in Orange County. And, and he says, President Reagan, this is very confidential, but President Reagan is going to go to Russia to meet with Gorbachev for the first time. And um, this is a big deal because he won no, no uh, American president have not been in the Soviet soil in decades. So he wants to do a speech in front of all the Russian politicians in Kremlin. So President Reagan asked if you were to write jokes for his speech. Wow. Yeah. And I'm like, uh, I'm thinking if this doesn't work, yeah. I don't have any oh, countries yeah. to go, <laughs> right? I so, but how do you say no to sure. someone like that? So I, I wrote jokes, and they liked them. To put they put them in the speech, and then they they send me the speech. They said, "Would you mind l looking it over, the speech, if we're in the right track?" I go, "Okay, uh, am I the most qualified person to That's do funny, this?" Right? Punching yeah. up Reagan's speech. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And so they sent me the speech, and I didn't like it. I mean, I thought, you know, it was kind of talking down to the, like telling them what they need to be doing. And I'm saying, I, I said, I, I don't really think that it's appropriate to take that tone because to them, you know, they're going to get offended. And that's not, I don't think that's what the president wants to do. Right. And, and they said, well, then can you rewrite the speech? <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is too crazy. So, uh, but I did. I put some comments in it, and you know, and I wrote what I thought. It was just shifting the tone of it, and they liked it, and that's how it went. So that's you amazing. come over, you literally learn English, and, and you're doing bartending classes, and then a few years later, you're punching up a speech that Reagan's going to make president. to Gorbachev in Russia. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. What I've, pressure? I have a question about uh, Branson. Yeah. You know, I've never been to Branson, but I yeah. know that you were a king there for a very long time. Yes. And uh, while I've never been to Branson, we have seen the commercial for Yakov's Dinner Theater. Yes. Uh, multiple times. <laughs> now, <laughs> here's, here's the question. Yes. You go over all the highlights of all the great things that people can uh, uh, enjoy as part of the night and the, and the show and the dinner and the, and the magnetic trays and everything. Yeah. <laughs> One of the big highlights uh, is that there are real linen napkins. Yeah. And that is highlighted in the commercial. Why in Branson do you feel like when we're advertising our theater, 
real linen napkins is going to be a selling point. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, thanks to YouTube for kind of exposing. <laughs> that's, the, where, that's where I saw it. <laughs> what's behind the scenes? Um, what in what? Yeah, that really was just meant for Branson. What happens wasn't in it? Branson stays in Branson. Okay. <laughs> and linen napkins is one of those things. Right. Uh, nobody ever mentioned that, but it was. <laughs> I was trying to get some uh, advantage over there. Is some. There's some very successful venues that serve dinner, and I only did it for like a year. Mm -hmm. um, after that, I realized that I'm not in the food business. That's not going to happen. But it was kind of creative because we were able to feed like 2,000 people in, in 20 minutes. Right. And it was really real good food, and everything was so... We the were napkins trying were legit. And yeah. candles, too. We I had, know, I heard about the candles. We had yeah. candles yeah. on the trays as well. <laughs> no, so I we know were trying that. to take some advantage because we're still seating on, on the airplane kind of seats, you sure. know, and mm -hmm. so it's not going to... So are you thinking that if I put in the commercial, there's real linen napkins here, that it, people are going to be like, this yeah. is a classy joint, this is the yeah. real deal, I'm going to take my wife? Than, yes, exactly. Uh, that's I what I was hoping for. It didn't work. It, it did didn't not. work. No, oh, no I'm it sorry did not work. That. Long term, it did not work. I'll no. tell you, if I take my wife out to a place, you and want linen napkins. I do. And yeah. they, they give me paper napkins. Exactly. I'm embarrassed. Yeah, totally. Linen napkin says class. Uh, absolutely. It does. It absolutely. That spells <laughs> class. <laughs> it <does>. Enjoy the show. <laughs> Enjoy the food. Oh, you got a little something on your hands. <laughs> and candles. There's a linen yes. napkin and a, and a and nice a candle. Fake on the tray. candle. Yes. <laughs> hey, were you were you married when you came to the states by yourself? No, 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 no. So you probably had a good run with women then when you. I did. I did. Yes, yes, I did. Yes. Thank you. Yes, I did. Yes. I uh, and got married to an American, uh, not real American. She's from Oregon, <laughs> and uh, we had two two children. Oh, Natasha and Alexander. It took us a while to figure out their names because when our daughter was born, my wife wanted a real American name for her, Brandy. And I said, Brandy Smirnoff? <laughs> why, why, why don't we just send her to Rehab Daycare Center so she can play with Jim Beam and Johnny Walker? And so what was interesting about that relationship, and this is why I'm on, my, I'm on second marriage now, um, because um, the laughter, that was an interesting, co uh, for, as a comedian, I noticed something, that there was a, so much laughter in the beginning of the relationship, and then slowly it kind of went away. Right. And I didn't notice it. Now, with my audience, if it happened, I would have noticed sure. it in the first joke, right? Second joke for sure. But I didn't. And over the years, and then we eventually broke up, and I started learning about this correlation between happiness and laughter. And I realized that laughter is the first thing that people really... I asked over four and a half million people in my theater, how many of you would go on the second date if you didn't have laughter on the first date? Applaud. No one. Four and a half million people. Wow. So we're using laughter yeah. as a gauge whether we're connecting with that person or not, whether that person has ability to meet our needs or not. Is their sense of humor uh, matches our sense of humor? Right. It's like catch and release program. Right. Right. Literally. I mean, and then you finally hook somebody with the same sense of humor and that's a great catch and you stuff them and you put them on the wall. Did you... That, did you have the opportunity to pick up tail while you were in Branson? Because you were the king there, or were you married? Or both. No, and I, <laughs> I, you I'm actually, both. I'm very, uh, I was married when we got there. Mm -hmm. Then I got divorced. Oh, that must have been a wild time. It, it, I, I'm not complaining. <laughs> but, I, but catch and release, I mean, uh, I went for a lot of, catching and a lot of releasing Good for yeah. you and releasing is uh, important yeah enough. absolutely <laughs> yeah. you have to release yeah, so i would typically <laughs> release that's too not soon. what i meant <laughs> oh, yes. oh. Yeah. release quickly and then release <laughs> release yeah. your date yeah, yeah. yeah that's... <laughs> but i i'm uh, married to a very beautiful uh ukrainian lady this is something that i decided that i'm going to go back to my oh to wow my roots yeah she oh good looking god. woman jim yes oh my god and uh so fantastic and, and, yeah and does she, she laugh at your jokes yes then we're good we're yes golden. beautiful and, woman and, who laughs at your jokes yes Forget and it. and the point is she makes me laugh too so it's Perfect. like really amazing and and so now i'm paying attention to this because laughter is the first thing we experience when we meet right right second thing is later is like intimacy third thing you live together and get married when things don't go well Laughter is the first thing to go. Second thing is intimacy. Third is your house. 
<laughs> I learned that. I learned it the hard way. House goes. Yes, House I learned sleep. that, yeah. and I know not to do it again. That's when you're sleeping in your dinner theater. Yes, yeah. with yeah. the na- leaning yeah. napkins and a yeah. candle. Yeah. Right, <laughs> exactly. Want more Jim and Sam? Catch up with full episodes and interviews from celebrity guests anytime on demand using the SiriusXM app. 